news. Uh, over the past two weeks, we've heard from Tom Albanese and Cynthia Carroll, uh, and this time we're delighted to hear from Sen Ricard Brandsike. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Andrea. Thanks very much, Callum. Okay, great. Well, um, first of all, just a little bit of an intro. Uh, Sven Ricard was the president and CEO of aluminium and energy company North Kidro for a decade from 2009, um, but he actually started his career at the company 23 years earlier. Um, he held various positions before he was CEO, including the president of Hydro Magnesium, the president of of uh, metal products, the president of rolled products, and the executive vice president of aluminium products. Um, he left in 2019. He is currently the chairman of the Norwegian construction and civil engineering firm Biodica. And since last year, he's also been a member of the board of nickel producer Aramet, as well as material solutions company Sibelco. And he recently agreed to be a, board, a member of the board of steel group uh, Schmaltz Bickenbach. Now I have to say, welcome Sven Ricard, but before I go any further, Steel, it's a bit like sleeping with the enemy after a, of your whole career in aluminium. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It, it's very different <laughs> and uh, it's uh, interesting, but uh, it is within the metal business that I find very interesting. So, uh, so I, I look forward to, uh, to joining this company, yes. Yeah, excellent. Well, I guess let's kick off. We've got a lot to get through today. We're going to we're going to talk a little bit about not just uh, 2008 and and now, but a little bit of a delve into the markets as we see them at the moment with some of the uh, you know the carbon issues and the overcapacity situation um, at the end. So, you know, talk take me back to those days. You've been at North Kidro for pretty much your career. Um, you were named the CEO in January 29, uh, 2009. Were you thinking, what have I done? <laughs> You know, if you look back, were there any indications that things were had been about to fall off a cliff when, you know, as you'd been building up to that role? Well, up to, um, I would say, at least the first half of 2008, uh, we had a quite good development in the metal and mining industry. Um, it, was, uh, it was a raw material boom uh, due to the, I would say, driven very much by the development in China with urbanization and industrialization. And um, um, our industry is not the first one that will uh, uh, re react to, um, uh, to a crisis. And uh, this, this was very much a housing bubble in the US. Maybe we, in a, with the hindsight uh, and the benefit of that, we should expect something to happen. <laughs> but um, I must say that the, the only signal I got at that time uh, was uh, as a responsible for the downstream business here too. Uh, we uh, saw at that time that there were quite some reduction in uh, uh, in the demand and bookings uh, in the building and construction company in the US market. So that was the first, we can say, indicator. We didn't know that that was an indicator of the finance crisis, but uh, uh, that at least was something we saw quite early. Uh, yeah, an early warning sign. So, you know, you take over three months or so, just over three months after Lehman Brothers files for bankruptcy protection. I mean, talk me through it at that time, really. You know, what did you do first? <laughs> yeah, I had a, a, trans a transmission period uh, with the previous CEO uh, after the announcement in January 2009. And uh, at that time, I was preparing for something what we called Agenda 2010. And that was really to prepare uh, the company for uh, the, the change that we needed to do. Uh, the company had already at that time uh, looked at capacity cuts uh, and uh, measures that uh, has to be taken. Uh, the Agenda 2010 uh, program consisted of three main topics. Uh, first was about navigating the storm. The second was about uh, keeping focus. And the third one was about shaping the future. So all of these uh, focus area we were working with. And uh, the first one, uh, when we were talking about uh, navigating the storm, it was really changing the mindset in Hydro from focusing on long-term profitability to focusing on short-term cash preservation. So it was about uh, releasing working capital. It was about cutting cost as much as we could uh, and uh, take out capacities uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, the second element, which was about, was about staying, fo keeping focus, was very much about health, environment and safety, that people should not uh, lose focus on, uh, on, on that. It was also uh, about uh, continuing the good work that uh, was uh, uh, ongoing with regard to 
uh, improvement uh, and uh, uh, keeping focus was uh, really uh, the, uh, the focus on customers also. Uh, shaping the future was uh, very much thinking about uh, the fact that uh, there could also be opportunities in such a crisis. And uh, we have seen that before. And uh, uh, that uh, at the same time, we also en em emphasized on research and development in the crisis because uh, we knew that uh, we could also do additional efforts and uh, deliver even better uh, innovation, uh, do more on uh, research and development. So that was uh, something we, we all have also developed uh, at that time. And obviously, you know, this is a very, you're sitting there dealing with your business, but as, as a broader macro picture, it's a bit of a disaster. You know, everything seems to be crashing down around, you know, credit default swaps are collapsing, you know, hedge funds are imploding left, right and center, you know, derivatives are blowing up, the banking stocks are, are, mm. are, are getting wiped out. How did you see North Kedro fitting into that macro picture? How do you deal with that? Hydro is an old company and um, uh, established in 1905 and uh, we have been out a winter night before. So we have been through uh, World War I, the Great Depression in the 30s, World War II. And uh, I think we have uh, learned from previous crises that it is important to keep uh, at least a decent financial strength. And, uh, and also when the crisis hit us, we we felt that, okay, Hydro is producing the right product. Aluminium has been the fastest growing base metal and uh, the world uh, long term will need more metal anyway. But uh, we had to handle the short term uh, uh, crisis in a proper way. Yeah. And, and you know, when you're going through this, uh, did you have any idea how long this is going to last? So short term, I mean, how long, how short did you think this term was? It's, it's quite hard to assess just like it is now. But, you know, back then, how long did, were you planning for in terms of short term? Well, <laughs> nobody knows how uh, the crisis will spell out and how long time it will last. So I think for, uh, uh, for us, it was um, trying to uh, develop scenarios. We couldn't, we know that, we knew at that time, we couldn't extrapolate uh, trends and try to, in a way, build on what was uh, the, the history. Uh, so it was about uh, looking at how bad could it be and how could we manage that or could we come through it even in different uh, really bad scenarios. Yeah, so you're, you know, you're, you, you talked through the agenda 2010 and your, your preservation of cash and you know, the, the need to keep liquidity and restructure and so on uh, capacity. How did you do? What was the, what was the outcome? You know, how, did, uh, how did the company we, we saw that immediately that due to the low aluminum prices, we, um, we saw we had to cut costs. And we came up with a $100 uh, cost reduction program. But we found out very shortly after the program was established that $100 was not enough. We had to cut costs even more. So we established a $300 cost cutting program uh, at the early stage where we really didn't know how to deliver on that. And uh, fortunately, uh, the organization was able to deliver and even more than 300 we saw after some years that uh, we had cut cost with 425 dollars per ton and uh, i'm sure the improvements continues today so this is uh, about creating a momentum in the organization and uh, and maintain the momentum because uh, this is also what i like with it, this industry that even you, if you have done a lot and done a lot of improvements there are even more to uh, to do and there are always new opportunities coming up yeah, it's, it's amazing how those costs can creep up again as well. So it's good to keep an eye on them and, and keep focused. Yes. I mean, those are the things that you can do. Are there, are there things that you decide not to do anymore? You talked a little bit about keeping research and development. That often is something that companies get rid of at, at, uh, in terms yeah, of the we, prices or cost cutting. I think we can say that we did cuts everywhere uh, except on uh, research and development. And uh, uh, for example, in headquarters, we, uh, we also did uh, significant cuts. We had a 30% uh, cut in uh, 2010, and uh, two years after, we had another target to cut additional 30%. We did uh, reach 30, but we cut uh, 25%. So uh, the headquarters contributed uh, significantly, also due to the fact that there were a lot of contribution from, uh, from the production uh, area and, and uh, production plots. Yes. Yeah. And let's talk through that a little bit. You know, obviously now we're seeing aluminium companies 
think about, not all do, but think about uh, cutting capacity in response to the, the current crisis. You know, I, I, I keep asking people this, so what, are you, what are you thinking about when you're making those decisions? Can you explain the thought mm. process behind uh, taking an aluminium smelter offline or reducing its capacity? Yeah. When I, I know I'm learning a bit about steel, and I see that it's easier to take out the electric arc furnace than uh, aluminium uh, <laughs> smelting uh, capacity. Because if you want to take out uh, smelting capacity in aluminium, uh, you have to be quite convinced that um, uh, the capacity has to be out of production at least one year. If it's shorter than that, you will probably tend to think that it's so expensive that let us keep the production running. So it, it is very much about uh, how you believe the crisis will uh, spell out. And if you think the crisis will take a long time, you take out capacity. But then the capacity will be out for, for a while and it will cost a lot of money to, to, uh, to bring it back again. Yeah. So, uh, so in that respect, uh, there is to try to keep the capacity going to see if the crisis is going over and, and that uh, things are improving. Uh, there are also another factor for some of the aluminium smelters in the world have uh, so-called take or pay energy contracts, which uh, means that it's very expensive. It's not only the, the, the smelting cost itself that uh, is an uh, uh, important factor here, but also the fact that you have to pay the, the energy uh, supplier. And, uh, and that is also a prohibiting factor for taking out capacity in our industry. Yeah, I mean, it seems to be the eternal problem with the aluminium industry since I've been writing about it or working, you know, in this in in this in this industry as a as a reporter. It's you know, it's the the big question is, you know, we'll come to overcapacity in a little bit. But is there anything that the industry could actually do to respond a little more, to help it respond a little more quickly and aggressively, and change these power agreements, or give them some sell some flexibility in their smelting operations, something structural? To make it less expensive to bring assets on and off, it's a hard one. Again, but... <laughs> it's it's not easy to bring on and off on short term. But uh, Hydro took out capacity at that time. We uh, in fact uh, closed on uh, uh, old Söderberg lines that were not so environmental friendly. They they were production line with high energy consumption, so that uh, was permanently shut down. And we took out temporal, temporary uh, capacity also for quite some years. Uh, at uh, some plants in Norway, the capacity has been uh, uh, partly brought back again, but um, uh, temporary shutdowns, but also permanent shutdowns were, were done in our company at that time. Yeah, North Kidro reacted, I would say, you know, very sensibly in, in that respect. And, and uh, yeah, so, you know, so what? Uh, of course, then you you tend to take off the high high cost capacity. So uh, the Söderberg capacity we took out, the old uh, technology that uh, was on top of our cost curve. So that means that by taking out capacity, we also moved uh, down the cost curve quite significantly during this, this period. Yeah. So th this adds to the uh, operational cost cutting that we did. No, for sure. I mean, we'll come a little bit later to, to the overcapacity situation that we, we're seeing now, but just sticking with, with 2008, you know, you obviously uh, took, out a, took out a lot of, of uh, production. We've talked about your cost-cutting program, you know, given all of that tough action, are there still places that you think companies can cut costs in 2020? Do they tend to creep up? Do they, do they is it just constant incremental cost-cutting now or...? No, it's, uh, that are I'm sure in, the, in this uh, COVID-19 crisis, there are a lot of focus on cost cutting and uh, obviously there are several areas still. I think that um, digitalization is now opening up for new opportunities and I think the, this crisis will accelerate uh, digitalization in companies. Uh, we did quite a lot um, uh, also after I left the company and it, I know it continues. Uh, we developed, uh, for example, uh, digital twins where we are producing uh, aluminium uh, digitally uh, and the data from that uh, digital uh, production is uh, exchanged with the physical data so we can reduce uh, cost and reduce energy consumption with the physical uh, on the physical production so there are, there are a lot of tools that are available today that was not available 10 years ago that means there are still opportunities so this is only one area but i'm sure there, there are other areas also that uh, where the, that will benefit uh, the industry and uh, uh, there are obviously still cost uh, uh, reduction opportunities in uh, this uh, industry for, for several years to come. 
Yeah, and, and speaking of opportunities, you didn't shy away from opportunities during the crisis. I mean, mergers and acquisitions, you, you, you certainly went for some of the big deals at the time. I mean, Barley's book site, mm -hmm. Illumina and Aluminium business, that was a $1.1 billion deal in the yes. middle, of, in the middle of, of a huge crisis. You know, can you explain the rationale and the, the metrics you use when you're picking a project like that? That, that was the third element in Agenda 2010 about shaping the future. And as I said, in, in such a, a crisis situation, there will always, always be opportunities. And um, um, I started quite early together with my team to, um, to talk to, uh, to Valla. I had the direct contact with Roger Agnelli, that was the CEO of Valla at that time. And uh, we agreed to establish teams and uh, see if we could do something here. And, um, in the Easter of 2010, I was sitting in London and negotiating with him. And, uh, and uh, just a few weeks later, we could sign an agreement that was a $6 billion deal. Uh, we took over the assets uh, uh, from Vale in Brazil, which was very much about securing raw material for over aluminium production, which has been an issue for our company for several decades. Uh, here, though, um, uh, we were concerned at that time that the Chinese uh, companies would establish themselves all over the world because we knew that China were on the way to be depleted on bauxite. And for, to avoid that, we should be uh, in a way painted into a corner. We, we really were very happy that we will be able to do that deal to secure again the raw material to our own production. Um, and was it Vale in particular you'd had your, your eyes on or was, it, uh, or was it just that opportunity arose? Had you, had you we, been on top of the list? This, um, I think you can, uh, if you ask um, some of the electrolysis or production guys, they will say that uh, the alumina from, uh, from the Alunorte alumina refinery is the best in the world. So I think uh, also when we look at uh, the cost position of that refinery, which is uh, also on the bottom of the global cost curve, it was a very competitive um, uh, asset together with uh, Pargominos, which is a uh, mine which were operating in an area which was deforested in the 70s and uh, where there are also bauxite for several decades to to come yeah and and let's not for, forget catalum as well in the in the middle east i mean that's yes and that, that came up as well that was another big project yeah and that, that was a project that was established uh, before i became a ceo uh, but uh, uh, during my time we, we uh, uh, constructed uh, the plant and started up the plant. Uh, it was also some problems there. We lost uh, power uh, after in the middle of the ramp up, uh, but we could, <laughs> after some uh, some weeks, come back again and uh, continue the ramp up. But uh, that uh, that is also one of the uh, lowest cost production plants in the world today. Uh, it was um, uh, established uh, based on uh, many decades uh, cooperation with the um, authorities in Qatar, because he do had the fertilizer production there since the uh, beginning of the uh, 70s. Right, yeah. And, you know, I, I've been asking everybody this that I've been speaking to, but, you know, when you're making these tough decisions, and are you sort of sitting there looking at your competitors, wondering what they're doing, or are you talking to each other and saying, okay, hang on, you know, I'm going to cut here. Obviously, you probably can't, but, you know, talk me through how that works in, in terms of making, making these decisions. <laughs> Uh, uh, there are very clear competition uh, uh, legislation here, so we are not uh, talking with uh, our uh, competitors. Uh, companies have to act individually on, on these uh, issues. You can say it's very much about survival of the fittest, uh, because uh, uh, in, in um, a cyclical industry like uh, aluminium, uh, it's very much about uh, the cost position, in addition to, of course, uh, innovation and the products you are, you are making. Uh, the prob problem in our industry is, as you also have indicated, is about uh, the supply-demand situation, the overcapacity, which has been, in, in a way, um, the, the dominant factor for, for many, many years. And also the fact that this industry has demonstrated that uh, we are not, not very good in, uh, in uh, reacting fast to, uh, to cy the cycling uh, and the cyclical uh, market. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe we'll just talk about that and we can, we'll come back to finish off the, the, the 2008 thing in a second. But um, very recently, the um, chief executive officer of Alcoa, Roy Harvey, um, on a, uh, at, a, at a conference issued a, a call to the 
to action for the aluminium industry to avoid a repeat of the high stocks, low price scenario that we saw, we've seen, as you say, for decades, but we, that we definitely saw in 2008. You know, are we ever going to see this aluminium overcapacity cut? It, that seems to be the big dream, but it, is it just a wishful thinking? <laughs> Again, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, the history shows that uh, this, uh, this may be a dream. <laughs> it's, uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, also a situation where there has been quite good balance. Uh, but uh, I think the, in a situation like we have now, uh, it, it will, I think, take some time and some pain before there will be adjustments in the aluminium industry. That has been the history, and I think it will happen again. So there, there is a situation with a very high risk of overcapacity for quite some while, for quite a while going yeah. forward. And the subsidy situation in, in certain parts of the world doesn't help either. Definitely, it's a, no. a big, big problem related to that. Yeah. Um, just going back to 2008, you know, and, and making a bit of a comparison to now in terms of, um, you know, we've talked about some of the, some of the differences and similarities you know obviously that was a financial crisis now we're seeing a health crisis that's creating a financial crisis you know what are what are your biggest kind of uh, sort of high level big differences or similarities that you see between 2008 and and COVID-19 pandemic I, I think this crisis may be more serious uh, this crisis is about saving uh, life and uh, Nobody knows when it will uh, when it will end. But the 2008-9 crisis was uh, financial. Um, uh, I must say that I'm more worried now than uh, in the past uh, because uh, um, we we have been through some some um, health crisis in the world uh, during the last uh, decades, but uh, it hasn't developed into pand pandemics. And uh, we don't have full overview of the situation yet, although we see that, for example, in, in Norway, it's uh, gradually opening up again. And we hope that it, we don't get a setback uh, due to that. Um, so um, I would say that uh, with regard to responses uh, in this industry, it is uh, um, very much to be prepared for something to happen. Uh, there will be black swans coming also in the, in the future. And I think uh, we have learned through this crisis, but also the previous, the finance crisis, and also crisis before that, that we need to have a decent financial situation and uh, some uh, inherent flexibility that we can use when a crisis are hitting us. Yeah, to be in a better situation. I mean, there's obviously uh, big changes that companies are having to make as well, but having the right finances in place, you know, adapting volumes as well, that's that's definitely something that we, we see in both scenarios. Um, in terms of opportunities though, you know, any opportunities, you talked a little bit about the opportunities of M&A, but any other opportunities you think might emerge from this crisis on a positive note? Well, we, know, we also know from previous uh, series crisis that uh, innovation is some, uh, sometimes accelerated. That, that is what we have seen during world wars, uh, but also during crisis, that uh, always uh, new innovation coming up that, uh, uh, and the technology will uh, move faster. Um, so, so it helps uh, competitiveness uh, for the companies that are able to do that. And that, that is also one of the reasons why Hydro did not cut in research and development during the previous crisis, because we, we knew that, okay, there, there can be also new opportunities on innovation here. And uh, this, this uh, for Hydro, it resulted in the fact that we built uh, a couple of years ago the most energy efficient uh, smelter on the west coast of Norway, the so-called uh, Hydro technology pilot, where we are producing aluminum with the lowest energy consumption in the world. Uh, so, so the, I think the, we could expect that some companies will come up with uh, with uh, new processes, new products that can uh, improve the competitiveness uh, of the companies. A lot of a lot of the uh, you know, there's a lot of debate at the moment as well over climate change, and you know, we've seen the effects on the on on the environment of of the lockdowns. But whether the actual agenda gets pushed back or not, I mean, aluminium uh, has been very it's taken a leading role really in, in the industry in terms of pushing for um, the, the metals role in a decarbonized economy. What, what's your thinking on that? You know, do you, do you see, how do you see aluminium's role? Do you think, how do you think customers see aluminium's role in that economy as well? Well, I'm, I'm uh, still an aluminium optimist and I think, I think that uh, uh, there are several opportunities uh, going forward. We see with the, uh, 
uh, electrification of cars, for example, there are more aluminium in electric cars than in, in uh, standard cars. cars. Uh, we've got energy efficient building solutions, for example, and aluminium will be a very important uh, material. So, uh, so aluminium will be a part of the solution going forward. And the fact that we need only 5% energy to, re to recycle aluminium, uh, it fits very well to a low carbon uh, circular economy going forward. And that is where we will end up uh, anyway. So, uh, so I think I'm quite optimistic when we go to the future of aluminium. And do you think customers will be as optimistic and, and will pay for it as well? You know, is that where you're seeing the demand coming from? Is that what's driving this as well? We, uh, I think it was two and a half years ago, Hydro, um, uh, we, um, we marketed uh, low carbon aluminium products. And uh, I know that the one of these products are sold out today. It's uh, at least uh, that was the signal I got uh, not a long time ago. And it was also sold out last year when I was a CEO. So, so there, there is a demand and there are also now um, uh, being established a premium for low carbon, carbon products. Not uh, as high premium as that uh, I would be happy to see, but uh, I think that will be the case going forward that uh, in, uh, when we are now looking at uh, uh, um, tools, uh, methods, processes, products for low carbon circular economy, the market will in the end also be able to and have to pay for it. Yeah. And uh, just switching back, you know, just to kind of wrap up in the next in the next several minutes, you know, in terms of the lessons that the industry learned, you know, do you think they were what what were the big lessons that they learned, and do you think they learned them on a permanent basis, or or, or are people quick to forget? I, I think again, uh, the, uh, we are we for, sometimes feel very surprised when there is a crisis, but when we look back in history, there has always been crisis coming up. Uh, and you never know when it's coming. So, uh, so I think uh, be prepared for black swans, I think is important, uh, and also maintain a decent uh, financial strength, as I mentioned previously, will be very important. Uh, and, and also, uh, I think it's, uh, mo most of all, this is about the organizational capability. So uh, to develop uh, the competence and the capability in the organization to handle such a crisis, Will be crucial for any company. Do you think the you know the 2008-09 financial crisis actually prepared the industry for the black swan type event that we're seeing today or is it impossible to be prepared for that? I, no, I don't think any crisis is similar as a previous crisis uh, so but we should still learn from history and uh, be prepared for for um, uh, for surprises going forward. So um, so I think um, um, we we should be prepared for different scenarios. It's very um, uh, tempting to uh, to extrapolate uh, extrapolate uh, trends, but we should be prepared pre prepared for different uh, scenarios. And some of them can be quite painful. Maybe they will not happen, but companies that are prepared for for crisis, uh, I think, will uh, manage uh, the crisis uh, in a much better way. Do you think that the the mining community in, uh, will actually permanently change after this crisis? If you know, if they learnt lessons in two thousand and eight, do you think? I and mean, there obviously are lessons that they're learning now. Do you think it will be there will be permanent changes as well, whether it's social distancing or or, or whatever it is, you know? And if if yes, you know, what what will those changes be? And if no, why not? <laughs> well, I think, the, the, again, looking at the previous crisis, there are always uh, changes in the industry structure. And I think that will happen again. There could be bankruptcies, there could be m as but I'm quite convinced that the industry will look different in a few years' time than what we see today. So there will be changes in the structure. I think also in the behavior that, uh, I think we have learned something from, from this crisis about uh, again how, how uh, a pandemic can, uh, can develop but also be, be better prepared if something like that should happen again. Yeah and we and you know just talking about the structural changes as well you know given that the downstream companies tend to be they're closer to the customer they have less flexibility it's harder for them to make make changes in that same way do you think there's probably people are going to think there's more value in being in the upstream and get and and kind of steer away from a more integrated model or is that is that a, I know you value the integrated model. 
yes, I think uh, for Hydro it was very much about, about uh, uh, utilizing the capability and competence uh, in, uh, in this industry. And uh, again, uh, secure the, the full value chain, uh, being close to the customers and, uh, and learning about uh, the end user market and seeing the customers all the way through, uh, through the organization. So, uh, but, but that is, uh, again, uh, there are different strategies for different companies here. So uh, I'm sure that uh, there will be other uh, uh, strategies for, for uh, the pure downstream companies, of course, as for the pure upstream companies. But I think uh, for, for any company today, I think uh, it's important to be, be ready for, for uh, some uh, surprises. Uh, again, to secure that uh, the organization can, can handle uh, serious crisis going forward as, as we are in the middle of today. For sure. And uh, just to wrap up, if you had to speak to a, if a CEO gives you a call and says, you know, I need a bit of advice on what should I do right now, what, what would you be telling them? What's your piece of advice if, you, if a mining or metals company CEO phones you and, and asks you? I, I think they, uh, they are really well aware of the fact that they need to preserve uh, cash and uh, there will be more short-term focus. But I think still that uh, uh, they should be aware that this is not a one-man show, it's a one-woman show. This is uh, about uh, what the people in the organization are capable of doing. So, so now they should really demonstrate what they are capable of. Thank you very much. Well, that's fabulous. Um, I'd like to say thank you for taking this time. I know you're busy with all of your board appointments and so on. And uh, great to also not just hear your experiences from from when you were at North Kidro, but also just some of your thoughts on the aluminium market today. So thank you very much, Sven Ricard. And I'll pass back to Callum to wrap us up. Thank you very much, Sven Ricard, and thank you very much, Andrea. Um, so yeah, that, that was the final one uh, of this instalment. Uh, all of these webinar recordings will be made available. Uh, so please feel free to, to consume them at your leisure. Um, Thank you very much, Andrew, especially for, for the past three great interviews. Uh, the last one, even more insightful than the next. Um, so uh, really appreciated that. Um, it would be a missed opportunity if I didn't plug the fact that Fast Markets has got a lot of upcoming webinars at the moment across the commodity space. Um, so including next week, we have a, a Ferro Alloys pricing webinar uh, and the week after we have a, a Copper Market webinar as well. So please do watch out for the updates coming to you um, and get involved uh, with the webinars coming up. Um, but yeah, finally, thank you, very, thank you very much once again, Andrea, and thank you very much, Sven Ricard. Thank you. Bye.